Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Welcome, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC, and welcome to the webinar. Our webinar is titled Narrowing the Gap, the California Consistency in Determining Findings Projects with our presenters Jessica Burke of the APS TARC and Don gibbons McWayne of Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations at San Diego State University. And I will introduce both of them shortly. Um, next slide. Uh, before we get started, a quick disclaimer. This webinar is being hosted by the APS TARC, which is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, and administered by WRMA Incorporated. The contractor's findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. A little bit about the APS TARC, if you're not familiar. Uh, the mission of the TARC is to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies, and also providing APS programs with individualized technical assistance. So reach out to us if you need help with anything. We're here to help you. Uh, next slide little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Uh, in the handout section of your webinar control panel, you'll find a copy of today's slides in Adobe Acrobat format. You may download these at any time during the presentation. Uh, please use your computer speakers to access audio for this webinar. Make sure your volume is adjusted to the desired level. If you have any audio or access problems during the presentation, we recommend that you sign out or X out of the webinar and then come back in, re-enter, um, log back in, uh, and that usually fixes most of the connection issues, but you're welcome to message us if you still have problems. Next slide. Uh, you may ask questions or share comments by typing them into the questions box at any time during the webinar. We will relay as many as we can during the Q&A portion of the webinar. This presentation is being recorded and will be posted to the APS TARC website along with a copy of the slides. Um, we'll notify registrants via email whenever it is available online. Everyone attending today will receive an email in about 24 hours with a link to download your certificate of attendance, but please note we're not providing formal continuing education units for this. And then finally, um, please take the brief eval that will pop up at the end of the webinar. It really helps us to get your feedback. There will also be, <coughs> excuse me, a link to that in the um, email that's sent out to you within 24 hours. If you don't get a chance to take it when the webinar is over, if you could take it then, that would be very helpful. So next slide. So I will launch a quick attendee poll just to get a sense for who is in the audience. I'm going to launch that right now. Um, the question is, what profession do you identify most closely with? Do you consider yourself an adult protective services professional, a medical professional, legal, other social services, or some sort of other profession? And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. Uh, if you're in full screen mode, you may need to exit out of that uh, in order to take the poll, but uh, you can just click on your screen directly to let us know which of these professions you identify with. I'll keep this open for probably another 30 seconds, give folks a chance to to respond. And maybe another 15 more seconds. Again, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. All right, that is the majority of our audience. I'm going to go ahead and close that poll out and share the results with everyone. So we've got about 78% APS folks. Don't have anybody that identifies as medical, 2% legal, 7% other social services, and then 12% in a profession other than what is listed here. Um, so thank you so much for responding to that. It gives us um, an opportunity to find out who is in the audience today. So next slide. So it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. <coughs> First up is Jessica Burke, which you can see on her screen. She's um, been in the field of social work for almost 20 years specifically serving various adult protection service agencies. Jessica is a subject matter expert in all areas of APS practice, including investigations, policy, assessment, developing curriculum, training, and building APS organizations. Jessica has also worked as the Assistant Director of Workforce Development at Sacramento State University College of Continuing Education, which she created a new social worker induction program serving 28 of California's northern counties. Very impressive. So we've got Jessica with us. Next slide. 
We are also very lucky to have Dawn Gibbons McWayne. She's the program manager for the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations Program, or APSWI, which provides competency-based multidisciplinary training to APS workers and their partners. Dawn has a Master of Social Work degree and is a licensed clinical social worker. She has over 20 years of experience as well, working with and on behalf of older adults and adults with disabilities. She worked for 14 years in the County of San Diego's Adult Protective Services Program as an APS specialist and as a supervisor. So we are very lucky to have both of these fabulous speakers with us today. And I think we'll first turn things over to Dawn. Thanks, Andy. Um, as Andy had mentioned, I'm with um, the Adult Protective Services Workforce Innovations Program, otherwise known as APSWE, and we are a project of San Diego State School of Social Work, um, and we're below that, we're under the umbrella of the Academy for Professional Excellence, and then um, comes the, our um, APSWE program. Um, within the Academy, we have a number of programs that support workforce development to health and human services professionals. Next slide. So thank you for being here to learn more about California's consistency and determining case findings project. Um, Jess and I love talking about this project, so really excited to be here. So first I wanna provide some context and background about California's APS system. So in California, we have 58 counties. The California Department of Social Services provides the coordination and technical assistance, and the counties have the responsibility for administering the APS programs. So although we have state statutes and policy and procedures within that, there's a lot of gray area. So we essentially have 58 different APS programs operating throughout the state of California. And then we also have three regional training academies. Um, so the program I'm with AppSuite is the regional training academy for the Southern California counties. And when we implemented this project, we implemented it in the six Southern California counties that comprise the Southern California region. Next slide. All right, so we're going to start to get into it. Why did we decide to do this? There were a number of reasons. Um, just we wanted an overall desire, or we had an overall desire for greater consistency. Um, we really wanted these case findings to mean something. Data was a huge part of this. Um, just an overall desire for better data, more consistent data, the APS field needs good data in order to drive the field forward um, around good policy, training, safety, to support the well-being of clients. Namers really highlighted the importance of data. Um, and it also, one of the things that highlighted for me was, the, in, in particular, was the inconsistency between states related to findings. And then, so that's on a nationwide basis. And then um, statewide, we have a monthly the counties have a monthly report that they complete. Um, it's got a variety of data elements and can, uh, findings is one of the data elements within that report. So, you know, namers, you know, real, I could really show it, especially when that first report came out, you know, the bell curve with, um, you know, all, in con all unfounded or all confirmed and then everything in between. Um, similar statewide uh, or within the state of California, we, it, um, looking at the data from our state reporting tool, um, really, you could see the inconsistency from county to county. Um, so all of that around, um, you know, kind of the, the category of, of wanting better and more consistent data. They, we also, within the state of California, have a consistency work group comprised of representatives from some of the um, Cal, uh, administrators or managers from California APS programs, and they have worked at wanting to improve issues of consistency statewide. Then we also have the ACL Voluntary Consensus Guidelines, which recommend that APS workers have training and have a clear understanding of the de definition of case findings. And in terms of the prior research, um, this study has always stood out to me, the 2016 study by Dr. Muscat and Wigglesworth and others that showed, uh, it was a study that was, um, based on data within California and looking at um, the, the findings from county to county and showed variability in findings or lack of consistency in findings from one county to the next. And one of the key recommendations was that it emphasized the need for training. Next slide, please. So we are a training academy and I thought, well, we can get all over that. 
um, let's develop curriculum and provide training. So that's what we did. The curriculum that we developed, I want to note, is based on California state statute policies and procedures. So in developing this curriculum, we used California specific language about the different types of allegations that we invest that um, California APS programs investigate how each of those allegations is defined and the three categories of findings that we have here in California. And I understand that that can vary widely from state to state just in terms of the types of allegations APS investigates, how you define those within your state and even what the categories are. Some states have more than three, some have less than three. Um, they might be defined differently. So in California, we have three categories of findings and they are confirmed, inconclusive, and unfounded. So when you're hearing from Jess in a little bit more specifically about the curriculum, just know that this was all based on California specific statute and policy and procedures. The curriculum is available on our AppSui website. It's free, just go to the website and click and um, you can download it. You can adapt the curriculum to your state the um, other states have, in fact, adapted this curriculum for use in their state. The, the TARC, the um, APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, has a brief, um, the Road to Consistent Case Findings, and in that they interviewed a number of states that, um, that adapted this curriculum to their state. Um, there's an example shared there, um, uh, Nevada APS I had talked about. We use California-specific language here. Um, so one of the things that Nevada found that they had to adapt was you know, both California and Nevada have categories of um, or allegations of sexual abuse that, that we investigate, but how those are defined within each state are different. So again, if you're wanting to adapt this curriculum, um, you certainly can do that and the, the TARC brief can provide some guidance for that, but just know that for the purposes of this webinar, we're talking about um, the California specific statutes. So again, what we did was we developed standardized training and then we delivered it throughout the Southern California region. Um, we delivered this to all APS professionals at all levels. So um, line workers or APS investigators or case managers, APS supervisors, managers or administrators, policy and procedure folks, everybody in all of the Southern counties at all levels received this training over one year's time. We did realize, and you see this up on the screen, that training alone will not create consistency, uh, but it was the starting place to provide all APS professionals in all the Southern California programs with the same foundation to build from in terms of moving toward um, greater consistency. And then we built in um, evaluation every step of the way. And I will talk more about that in a moment. Next slide. So um, as I mentioned, we built an evaluation at every step of the process. At the end of the training day, we um, would ask the trainer to step out of the room and the, or the virtual room. Um, and then we would ask for, for feedback from the participants, um, really letting them know we want your true and honest feedback. We might be delivering this again tomorrow to your colleagues and we want this to be useful. So please tell us what works, what doesn't, what do you want more of, what do you need less of, because what we hear from you, we're, we will likely adapt and then um, improve so that the next delivery is even stronger um, and better supporting your colleagues. So we do, we ask for that live feedback right there in the room. We also have a formal survey link that we, um, you know, we show to them and they go on their devices and complete that. So we, um, we have that way of getting input also. Um, as part of this project, we uh, built into the curriculum was a pre and post test. So folks would review a vignette, determine findings before they take the training, and then at the end of the training, um, doing that same thing. So that pre and post so that we could compare, are we seeing differences? Are we seeing um, more accuracy and more consistency in the case findings um, when we compare pre and post training? Um, we also were asking for feedback at all of our stakeholder meetings. We have two main stakeholder groups that we meet with each month. One is the Southern California trainers, uh, APS trainers, and then the, um, the Southern California APS managers, program managers, or administrators. And so from each group, we were seeking feedback. We wanted to know from the trainers, how's this going from your perspective in terms of training? Like, where are the trouble spots? Where is really, where is it going smoothly? And then like sharing best practices. 
Um, and then with the managers, similarly, like how's this going in your program for you, for your staff? Are you seeing changes? Are you not seeing changes? Um, you know, what support do you need? What, what changes do you need us to make? And then we were, um, based on all of that feedback, we were course correcting as we, as we moved forward. Some of the input that we were getting from participants really early on was that they saw the value in using a tool called the matrix. And Jess is gonna show that to you and walk you through that. Um, they felt better supported in um, determining findings. They felt like um, it made the, um, the process of determining case findings more concrete and provided a more consistent way of determining findings based on the evidence. And then um, county to county, we, San Diego was the first county to, um, to receive this training and um, they got a call from the state really early on based on their input to the state reporting form. What, like, hey, what's going on? Like your data looks really different all of a sudden, what are you doing? Um, so that was really, um, that was really um, heartening and helped us feel like, okay, we're on the right track. I think this is working. Um, and then uh, we also had uh, within our Academy for Professional Excellence, um, uh, our evaluation team was doing um, some more formalized research, looking at the state data before we started doing this training and then for a period of time after we had delivered the training um, just for these specific counties and then engaging whether we were seeing changes and, um, and there were um, significant changes towards greater consistency um, that we were seeing. And now over to you, Jess. All right, thank you so much, Dawn. So I'm gonna be going over uh, some of the tools. Basically, this is a snapshot of the training uh, that was provided to all the California counties. Uh, but a little bit of background on how I came into this was uh, Dawn and San Diego State, the Academy for Professional Excellence, uh, had approached me and asked if I wanted to work on this project with them. And I had utilized the matrix before, the matrix being right here in the upper left-hand corner, but I'll go over that in depth here in a minute, and our finding standards in the past, but I wouldn't necessarily at that time call myself a subject matter expert with consistency and findings. So I had an opportunity to work with Dawn and her staff over the next couple months to uh, build out some existing curriculum to, to really um, flip it so it could be delivered in a virtual environment because we were in the COVID period. And so I became started slowly becoming a subject matter expert with the matrix and guiding principles. So what I did was I pulled 20 of my old cases uh, from when I was out in the field as a worker and applied the matrix to my own findings. And these were cases that I had done on year 12. So this is, you know, very experienced investigator. And when I pulled the matrix and compared them to my findings, 14 out of 20 cases were incorrect because I was only using my own judgment, which at times can be clouded by biases. So really this was an opportunity for even myself to say, okay, we need to have a more consistent approach, the same tool that everybody's using to narrow that gap. And when I say narrow, there's always gonna be gray type of areas, right? We're coming to a finding is gonna be difficult, but if we can narrow that, uh, Don had touched on it briefly, uh, an example of narrowing the gap. Uh, when I first came to the county that I worked at, one of the Southern counties, this was back in the early 2000s, I was told, Jessica, you never do an unfounded determination. And I said, really? They said, yes, because how do we know for sure that it's unfounded? And I remember I was given the example of, let's say you receive a report of financial abuse, son is financially abusing mom, you go out there, son has been deceased for years. That would be unfounded. But other than that, it's, you know, we don't go unfounded. I went to another county to train consistency and find it. And they said, we never do confirmed ever unless we're 100%. So as to Don saying findings were all over the place, that's an interpretation of how they were. Different counties were interpreting findings different ways. So this right here on your screen to kind of set the stage, there is our consistency matrix as you see up to the uh, left-hand corner on the top, and then our finding standards. So the tool, the matrix, is not going to create consistency alone. It's not a one-stop shop. It's not a 100%. It's a tool. And then here's our finding standards. They're a combination of both judgment and a reasoned approach. So 
they're based upon, and I don't like reading from my screen, but this is important, the facts and information gathered by the APS worker that's related to the essential elements of the of abuse alleged and the evaluation of those facts using their own expertise, experience, training, and critical thinking skills. So again, it's not the here's the matrix, this is going to take, you know, your own judgment out of the findings. It's just something to assist in determining those findings. So I'm going to briefly go over the columns. Again, the slides I'm going over are technically a six-hour training, so I apologize if it's a little bit quickly, uh, but uh, this typically is a six-hour training. So when we have the matrix, okay, this is done by category. So we have the abuse or neglect category. So we have our physical abuse here. This is the one we're going to demonstrate. This is from our welfare and institutional codes, along with the operational definition. But the use of the matrix for the worker when coming to a determination actually starts over here. We go from right to left. So the worker goes out, does their investigation, collects their evidence, brings all of that back, and then opens up this matrix and works through it to come to a finding. So we start with the signs of abuse column. This is the first column to the right. So these are things that you can see, hear, smell, evidence that abuse is occurring. And these can be physical, environmental, or behavioral. So we go through your evidence or signs of abuse. Next, we go to this column, the evidentiary issues to consider. These are questions you're asking yourself, you're asking collaterals, reporting party, whoever that may be, to see whether or not the abuse occurred or if there's any types of explanation for the report. The essential defining elements, I always kind of joke with my classes when I train this, this is your what I call your best friend column. This is the main column you want to look at because, and something I really want to highlight of this training, in California, in order to get a finding of confirmed, you must have evidence to support all of these essential defining elements. So they must reasonably support. And I'm going to talk about reasonably in a minute. So you have here physical abuse. So in order to have confirmed, was it one, non-accidental use of physical force or physical deprivation or use of medications for control. So yes or no, did we meet that? And did it cause injury, pain, impairment, or could have caused physical pain or impairment? So we have to have evidence to meet each of these. Um, so we're gonna go over that here in a minute. So you're gonna notice I said reasonably. What does reasonably mean to me? What does it mean to you? That can differ. So I'm gonna to go to this slide and then next slide, I'm gonna kind of talk a little bit more about it. So in California, to have a finding of confirmed, evidence must reasonably support all of the essential defining elements, okay? So more likely than not. Unfounded, evidence reasonably refutes the essential defining elements of the alleged abuse, but unfounded does not necessarily mean that it did not occur. There's just not enough evidence to go unfounded. So if we can't go confirm or unfounded, this is where it's inconclusive. And I say inconclusive last because when I work through the matrix, I like to say, do I have enough to be confirmed? If not, do I have enough to be unfounded? If not, then that's where we go inconclusive. So evidence reasonably supports only some of the essential elements of the alleged abuse. So as I said, reasonably can be interpretive, okay? It may look different for you and I. The reason why we use reasonably is because in California, we work under what is called preponderance of evidence. So that comes down to reasonably or more likely than not versus proof beyond a reasonable doubt, which is what you need to legally convict somebody in court. I always have to validate my investigators and my workers, and I wanna validate everybody on this training today. Do we want proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Are we moving towards proof beyond a reasonable doubt? Absolutely. I wanna validate that right out the gates. I wanna know whether or not this occurred. 
but sometimes we all, sometimes, many times, we won't have all the information needed to go proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Therefore, that is why we are under preponderance of evidence. So is it more likely than not? And as we rolled out this training to the entire state, that didn't set well with some people. And I completely understand it because, you know, we're good at what we do. We want to do that 100% thorough job. And we're still doing 100%. But doing 100% of our thoroughness might not always pull in all of the information that we need. And we have to make a determination on a finding. So again, just wanted to clarify the finding standards that in California, we are working under preponderance of evidence versus proof beyond a reasonable doubt. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna demonstrate using the matrix live for you here with a given scenario. So this scenario is for training purposes only. I know some of you may want more information as we're uh, going through this case scenario together. But what I want to say is pretend like this is on, this case is on your desk and this is all the information that you gathered or were able to gather during this investigation and you have to make a determination, okay? All right, so let's meet Mr. Peter Frown. APS receives a report from a caretaker alleging financial abuse by client Peter Frown's son. The reporting party shows the APS professional a bank statement with the client's name on it. And a line item shows that a $10,000 withdrawal was made via check. The RP stated that Peter was upset at his son for taking money from his bank account. The APS professional, so you, visits Peter and he is upset about the withdrawal by his son, but cannot give details of the events that led to it. The APS professional calls the son who offers to scan and email a copy of the DPOA a copy of the check made to pay the overdue property tax, and a copy of the bill from the county's tax collector for the overdue $10,000 in property tax and threatening legal action, which includes selling his property. The APS professional received the scan documents shortly after the phone call. So what are we talking about here? Financial abuse. So here we have our abuse or neglect category and our operational definition. But we are starting over here. So signs of financial abuse. Remember, these are things that you can see, hear, smell, statements, evidence that abuse is occurring. And these can be physical, environmental, or behavioral. So right here, we have withdrawals from withdrawals or transfers from a bank account that the client cannot explain. We have that right here. Next, evidentiary issues to consider. These are things you're asking yourself, asking others, collaterals, reporting party to see whether or not the abuse may or may not have occurred. So we have down here with this arrow, who is making the financial decisions and are the decisions being made in the client's best interest? So now we go over to our essential defining elements column. Remember, that's our best friends column. And in order to have a finding of confirmed, each of these must reasonably be met with some type of evidence. So have we met essential defining element number one? Yes, we have funds, property, or assets belonging to the client. Have they been taken, secreted, appropriated, or retained, possibly through undue influence? Yep. We have the $10,000 check that was taken from his account. So let's go to three and or four. Was it taken for a wrongful use or with intent to defraud? So what I want you to ask yourself, it's not a poll question, but based on this information and this information only, would this be confirmed, unfounded, and inconclusive? Just give you a second to think about that. So we've met one, we've met two, but have we met three or four? And the answer is no, this would be unfounded. The money was not taken for a wrongful use and likely to be harmful for, to the client, nor was it taken with intent to defraud. The son wrote the check to protect the client from the consequences of the overdue property tax bill and the consequences of potentially sell the, the uh, county uh, selling the client's property. So in this case, it would be unfounded. 
So before we go to the next part of our training, again, we gave this training for an opportunity for staff to try it on, to check it out. Uh, this matrix is a lot. I mean, in a good way, but it also takes, uh, you know, some time to learn, try it on, get to know it. So I want to leave you with a little piece of advice is if you're implementing something like this in your county or state, I would say start slow and be patient and kind with yourself. So Jessica, what do you mean by that? Take an easy case. Take a case that you know. And like I did with my 20 cases and apply it to the matrix. So take a case that's pretty clear cut and work through the matrix to familiarize yourself with it. Because if we take those hard, sticky cases right out the gates and we're trying to learn the matrix, that can be difficult. Example, one of the cases I took when I was learning the matrix was a caregiver had stolen. My client had one of those Costco Cheeto plastic jugs full of change. And the client called it in. My caregiver stole my Cheeto bucket of change. So I go up there. She shows me the Cheeto bucket. She show, you know, says, yep, she took it. Go to the provider. Yep, I took it. I stole it. Okay. But regardless, I went through the matrix just so I could learn, okay, what are my signs? What are my evidentiary issues? And then what are my essential defining elements? So that's what I mean when I say start slow, be patient with yourself, and don't expect the gap to close, right? We still are using our own professional judgment, our own critical thinking. The other thing I want to say, I talked about this earlier very briefly, is the matrix allowed me to remove some of my biases. Uh, you know, biases, we all have them, good, bad, whatever that may be. But um, just being vulnerable here, when I would get a case on my desk that had an extensive APS history, I would look at that case before going out and say, I know this is going to be confirmed. So, you know, putting on a different lens, an unbiased lens, and then using the matrix as a tool to help remove those biases really helped close that gap of findings for me. So I hope this was helpful for you. Uh, we're not done yet, but just wanted to take a few minutes to walk you through that matrix. So Don, I'm gonna hand it back over to you for sustainability. Thanks, Jess. Um, so echoing what Jess had said, the first step, and I had mentioned um, earlier, the first step was the training, um, and that's to get um, get everybody um, operating on the same information and to set that foundation. And then the hope is that then you start practicing it as a program. Um, and what about this case? And what about that case? And really practicing and working through the matrix. Um, so some of the subsequent steps when we talk about sustainability, um, we did not want this to be just a one and done. The APS programs didn't want this to be a one and done. Um, so we had talked from the beginning about how do we build sustainability. So one of the pieces of this was for the counties that could, um, training their AP, internal APS trainers to deliver this training. So that was building that internal capacity within the program so that as new workers come on board, they could also be trained up on this. Some counties have decided to offer this annually to all of their staff just to make sure that it's really staying fresh, fresh in people's minds. Um, and that questions can be asked about, you know, as a county, how are we handling these kinds of situations or those kinds of situations? Because there's still, even within all of this, there's still, as you know, um, we as humans are very complex and um, APS situations can be very complex. So um, you know, even with this guidance, there are there will still be some gray areas. Um, and it's important for those conversations to keep happening within programs about, okay, we've used the guiding principles, we've used the matrix, and then within that as a program, what are we doing about these kinds of situations? Um, so in terms of the sustainability is these having these continued conversations um, as a county, as a program, and then um, we have con have um, continue to have these conversations with, with the counties as well about how is it going in your county? Are you still using this? What do you need? Uh, and it really varies. Again, there are some counties that didn't have 
um, a trainer available that could keep this going. So for those counties we're talking about, do you need us to, to deliver this training for you? Like, should we be looking at maybe delivering this training a couple of times a year for the counties that don't have trainers? For the counties that do have trainers um, and have more of that internal, um, that infrastructure built in to support this, um, some of them were asking for, Jess had talked about, you know, start simple, simple, more clear cut cases and then build from there. So um, for, for the programs that were can, moving forward with this work, one of the things they had asked us for is give us some more case scenarios and then um, you know, kind of walk us through how to use the matrix. Um, so we did that once and then we got, well, those were okay. Like they're a little bit more complicated, but like we need more, like we need even more complexity. Um, so that's where the, the booster and this um, CIF consistency and case findings TOL transfer of learning tool come in where, um, you know, we've, we've got, we're providing some more case scenarios for programs to work through with the, the guidance around the findings. Um, the T for T is the training for trainers. I had um, referenced that for, for counties that could, they had their internal trainers deliver this training for their staff. Um, and then turnover happens, right? Um, people come and go. So the trainers that had um, been delivering this at the beginning of the project weren't all there by the end of the project or you know, today, several years later. So we realized that we needed something available for as new trainers come on board so that they could also be trained up on how to deliver this training. Cause it's a, especially delivering virtually, it's a fairly complex curriculum. So we, um, we have a training for trainers or a T for T video that's available. So as new trainers come on board or trainers in other areas that want to get trained up on this, they can access this to get tips and tricks and um, best practices about delivering this training. We also from time to time have brought the trainers together, you know, new trainers, experienced trainers um, to talk about how is this going to talk, uh, have, uh, allow the new trainers a space to, um, to ask questions about you know, um, spaces in the curriculum that are a little bit more complex or um, areas that spark more challenge or more discussion and how, how to manage that. Um, and then also in terms of consistency, there's an importance to having consistency in the way this is trained. Um, so that's what part of the that, um, T for T or training for trainers process is, is about. Um, so yeah, these are, and these are things that we thought about from the beginning, again, because we knew that this, we were really from the beginning wanting to implement and sustain change and really come to a place where in, for the long term, we're having greater consistency in the way that we determine case findings statewide. And that brings us to our next slide. Oh, all right. It looks like we are at some questions here. Uh, it's time. It is indeed time for questions. So we've got one already. And just as a reminder, you can type your questions in the questions box at any time. We will relay them to our presenters. Um, so this one is a really good one. First, it was a comment that said, nice work. And then the question was, was there a different approach uh, for larger versus smaller counties? Um, this person just made a comment that, you know, it can be hard for smaller counties to, to have their staff to reserve time for a training. So was there any consideration to that? Were you able to? make any changes. Uh, Don, if it's okay, I'll start with that one. Um, so yes, we were able to meet the needs of the smaller counties. As uh, Andy had said in my bio, I'm the assistant director up north and a lot of our northern counties are tiny. Uh, some of them are big as well, but um, in some of the northern counties, they're doing both in-home support, adult protective services and CPS. So what we did was because the Northern Training Academy serves 28 northern counties, we would solicit training once a week so they could take turns from other counties coming. So let's say they only had three workers. They would send one worker one week, another one the next week, and so on uh, and so on. So, um, and then as far as, Great. yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead, Jessica. Oh, and as far as um, I saw the QA portion too about their own QA standards, this was a statewide initiative, even though some counties were doing some things differently. So the messaging was, and Don, feel free to jump in on this part too, because this is kind of more on your portion. The messaging was sent down to the counties way ahead of time. They knew this training was coming. 
So those who had QA programs, uh, at least the county I came from which was a larger county, we were already starting to incorporate that into our quality assurance process. Um, so Don, I don't know if you had anything else you wanted to add. Sure, and this just in terms of the um, implementing change part of this, it, this really started out of a conversation with the counties. Um, they wanted to see more greater consistency in case finding. So, I mean, it started out of conversation with them about, you know, what we say, like, I think we should develop some curriculum, you know, an instructor-led curriculum. What do you think? Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and then, okay, we have this curriculum, so we want to start delivering it. What do you think? Yeah, let's do that. And then it was from the counties about, let's do that. And we want all the counties to get the same training over one year's time. And, and so I said, yes, and we need everybody within the APS program. It can't just be the soups or the managers or the line staff. It needs to be everybody um, receiving this training. So, um, so because the, um, there was that buy-in from the county um, APS administrators or managers from the beginning, it really helped to, um, to set the stage and set the expectation so that, as Jess said, um, you know, if you're a county with a strong QA component, you might be thinking like, yep, we're going to want to roll this into our QA. We're going to want to adjust our policy and procedures. We're going to want to um, adjust our documentation standards in order to, to incorporate this, you know, again, depending on, on the needs and the, and the focus of the county. That's great. Thank you both. And I think people assume, people here in California, and if they're not in California, they think urban. They don't realize you have some very rural counties there as well. So. Um, for sure. So the great answer. Um, can you speak a bit about how you managed this change for groups who were maybe less than enthusiastic about the change? So this this question occurred to me too while you were speaking. So I'd love to hear the answer. Don, you yeah, want to? This up? happened. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it did. Not everybody was on board with this from the beginning. Um, and again, one of the keys was having that the fact that. Um, leadership within APS programs had all decided like, yep, we're, we're on board with this, we're doing this. Um, so that, that, was, that was huge in, in terms of a starting place. Even with that, however, um, you know, this is a big change in any time. I mean, for any of us, like anytime there's change, there are feelings of like, what, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing fine. Like what, I'm, I do this a certain way. Um, right. Like this doesn't make sense to me. So, um, one of the things that, well, so a couple of things. Um, I had mentioned we went county by county. So um, one county at a time, um, we're having conversations about, okay, how's it going in that county and what are the lessons learned? Um, so having the, uh, making sure that the um, APS leadership was establishing for staff, like we're doing this, we're participating, it's gonna be new. Um, but like the expectation is that everybody's attending and participating. Um, one of the um, one of the things that evolved as the process was going along was ensuring that there was someone from that county in each training delivery. So mm -hmm. I had mentioned that not every county has an APS trainer, or even the counties with an APS trainer um, didn't um, didn't necessarily have this um, the ability to be the one delivering that training. So, but we really it was very important to have somebody from that county in each training delivery that could reinforce as um, as concerns would come up about why are we doing this or do we really have to do this or um, that it was reinforced like, yep, yep, we're doing it. Um, and then also as county specific questions came up, there was somebody in the room that could address that as well. Um, and doing the, making sure that there was somebody from that county that was a champion in the room um, really helped with, with the buy-in and helping in moving the process forward. Do you have it as having been the trainer in the room, Jess? Do you have other? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Don, you pretty much knocked it out of the park there. But uh, I know with a couple of the counties, again, these are the larger counties, so not the smaller counties, but they would actually have a manager in there um, managing, mm -hmm. you know, if there was expectations of pushback that we were, you know, this is this is the new way we're going. It's I, I'm just going to be honest. It's not really up for discussion. This is a statewide initiative. And yeah. so, you know, we're going to support you through this change, but this is a change that is happening. So I really think a lot of it had to do with the messaging. Um, I trained a good majority of the counties in California. 
I, well, I'm just being honest. I only received like hardcore pushback from one person in one county. I got some grumbling here and there, but for the most part, because of the ahead time messaging versus, hey, you know, I woke up in the morning and now everything's changing. It wasn't like that. So they knew it was coming. So I think for at least myself as the trainer, that was really helpful. But um, one other thing I can say is training new workers now who receive consistency and findings as part of their new worker uh, investigator induction is that they're really excited about it. They love this tool because when you're brand new and you're, you know, learning the job mm -hmm. and, oh, my gosh, I have to make this determination. I, I'm still learning. Uh, they've really had a lot of great feedback with being able to utilize the tool. That's great. Those are great tactics to help develop buy-in. It sounds like you're very thoughtful about the, the process with it. So, And Jessica, you just touched on another question that came through about how do you provide this training for new workers? It sounds like at one point that uh, this person who's asking the question sounded like there was only one training per year. But if you have people who are coming in at different times, how do you onboard them with the process? Great question. So the initial rollout back in Don, I think it was 2019, if I remember correctly. Okay, um, was statewide, whether you were new, whether you experienced, everybody received the same training around the same timeline, time frame. There was a time frame. So for those who are new, we actually have, um, we created a new worker induction program that has skill building um, classes that build off of the NAPSA and Academy e-learning. So we actually go into the classroom and do skill building. So they have 16 modules they have to take over the course of eight weeks. And the last module they take is consistency and findings because uh, it is a little bit more advanced. I mean, you need to kind of have some of, I mean, not necessarily prerequisites, sure. but you got to have a kind of OK idea of what's going on now uh, before taking it. But we provide that as one of their last classes uh, before graduation. And up north mm -hmm. and in central, we have two new, so, I'm sorry, four new investigators slash social worker inductions a year and they can all come mm. from different counties and the consistency and findings training like i said is embedded into that so uh, most of, uh, i believe 53 out of 58 counties are receiving this induction program so they all receive the consistency and findings as part of it and then we also have here in california we also use an e-learning component um, so that having the e-learning makes it, you know, it's available whenever folks come on board. And then this curriculum is the instructor-led skill building. So the e-learning provides the foundational um, information. And then when they um, come in person or um, in, in Zoom or in the virtual classroom, um, it's um, really practicing that skill building portion. Great. Sounds like lots of opportunities then for new new staff to to get on board with the process. Um, another question, are you seeing an increase in confirmed cases and or is the time frame for cases staying open decreasing? I'll repeat that again. Are you seeing an increase in confirmed cases and is there any um, decrease in the amount of time cases are staying open? The overall change in terms of the findings was um, less inconclusive so more confirmed more unfounded and less inconclusive and we really attribute that to inconclusive um oftentimes being used as kind of a catch-all like i'm not sure, sure. i'm not really comfortable which way yeah. to go i just feel safer doing inconclusive um so having these clear guidelines and i hear what you're saying too jess about new workers um liking this because it it provides them with support it's not just like i'm going out on a limb with making this finding it's i made this finding because um so uh, but to, to answer the question into that that was the change we saw in terms of the findings was um more confirmed more in, more con, more confirmed more unfounded sure. and less inconclusive okay. um i don't know about um length of uh, if there's a connection to length of time that sure. cases are open um, Jess, have you seen anything on that? I haven't seen as far as length of time, but what I have seen is an intentional effort, not that there was less effort being put in before, but to not go inconclusive. So looking at that lens, did I really do 100% thorough investigation? Is there any other evidence from any other party that I can get to help tip that scale? Uh, so that's what I've seen, I, but I can't speak to whether sure. it increases or decreases the length of the time opening. I've just seen that more intention of trying to stay away from inclusive and get as much evidence yeah. to either do a confirmed or unfounded. 
great. Yeah, maybe that's an area for the future to look at. So um, another question that came in, do you plan to update this document outside of legislative changes, for instance, uh, or is it a static document? You know, will you be updating it down the road or have a time frame for that or look to that? Um, in terms of the the guiding principles or and the matrix, though the matrix is based on state statute. So mm -hmm. um, if statute changes, then certainly the matrix would need to change as well. Um, in terms of supporting documents, the uh, the consistency work group um, continues to meet. They're an active work group and. Um, when questions had come up about like there are just a lot of gray areas like the matrix is great the guiding principles are great but there are still a lot of gray areas so the consistency work group had um, developed um, an faq a frequently asked questions document to try mm -hmm. to get at more um, the what are the the majority of kind of the gray area questions that tend to come up once you start using and applying um, the matrix and the guiding principles. So that's something that was developed more recently. Um, and certainly as um, you know, as more questions come up or um, if the counties have more needs around this, then um, you know, then um, then things can could change as well, you know, just to make sure, sure that um, that it all continues to align with state statute and meets the sure. needs of, of the programs. Yeah, and to piggyback off of what Dawn said, uh, she was speaking of state statutes, as far as, let's say, the signs of abuse column, right, evidence. Um, it's not necessarily exhaustive. We try to be, mm -hmm. but an example is we're revisiting, I believe right now, Dawn, self-neglect because um, uh, intentional homelessness, uh, those who, like, are, um, you know, uh, suicidal, all of those signs of abuse, like actively suicidal, aren't on there. So we've had a yeah. couple of cases come back to QA saying, do I unfound self-neglect because I don't see suicide on here? So it's it's a living document. Uh, it not mm -hmm. only parallels with the state statutes, like Don was saying, but also things that come up more and more and more, uh, benefits trafficking, things like that. So, Sure. Yeah. Great. Great answers. Um, another question, are there any plans to look at administrative data to see if counties are becoming more consistent? Has there been any efforts around that or is there a plan um, around that? Uh, when we had implement, initially implemented this project um, through APPS, we, we had um, our academy evaluation team, um, you know, come look at the, the statewide mm. data and, and do that comparison. Um, we've not done another comparison since the initial rollout, um, and that's that's a good. I know it was a question, but <laughs> I'm taking it as a suggestion. Yeah. It would be interesting to see as more counties are rolling this out. Um, where are we now? Certainly. Um, another question. Um, you mentioned earlier that you know some states have different findings. Um, are you aware of any other state adapting this? Do you have any information about other states adapting um, this matrix? Yes, definitely. In the TARC brief, there's information about Nevada, Montana. Oh, and there was a third state. Uh, I think North Dakota. I don't know. Um, I think so. Maybe. Michelle Guyette. Um, state, um, so I know that those three states adapted it and um, was super helpful to be able to, to read through that and find out more about, you know, what are what are the hurdles or the challenges when you're looking to adapt this to your state. Um, and kind of some of the, the big things that I saw were around, um, really around, around statute. Um, and, you know, likely kind of the level of levels of evidence that you have mm -hmm. um, and, you know, making sure that, that all aligns. Um, and if some, when um, we had talked about this during the NAPSA conference, there were questions also about states that have um, abuser registries and how that might come into play in your state. California does not have um, an abuser registry. Sure. So that's, that's not something that, um, that we've considered. Um, you know, around this project, but um, that would that would be a consideration for those states that do certainly. 
And if anyone's interested in reading the brief that Dawn mentioned that the APS Turk published, I put our email address in the chat. You're welcome to reach out to us right now. Our website is down, but it should be back up soon. But in the meantime, um, if you'd like a copy of that, just reach out to us and we'd be happy to provide, um, provide that to folks. Um, let's see, have you run into any issues with the examples include but are not limited to, limited to on the tool? Um, this person's found some issues with providing examples on tools um, because some staff start only looking for those examples that are provided. So any feedback about um, you know, people taking too literally some of the examples that have been provided on your form? I, pers this is personally, um, personally, when mm -hmm. I've met with the counties after the training, I haven't seen that. Um, I feel like the, the, again, feel like the workers, they are really thankful that, you know, it's not just here's the tool and it's set in stone, that it's the tool helping them walk through their own critical thinking and their own expertise and their own judgment. So they really appreciate the marrying of the two. I hope I'm answering that question. Uh, correctly, because at first there was Thank some you. pushback as to, oh, okay, so it's just the matrix, so it's taking my job away from me in a sense, uh, and that yes. wasn't it at all. It's just more of that reason, step-by-step -step approach to help guide the workers into mm -hmm. making a decision. Um, so I, I hope that answered some of the question. And yeah. I think that's some of the importance of having everyone within the program receiving the same training. So, um, you know, if there is a worker that is feeling challenged in that area or not quite sure how to apply or, um, you know, only like applying, like, well, it only says this, so I only do, you know, that those are conversations that yes. can be had in supervision or, um, you know, if it's a larger program. I know there's one county where in when they have their meetings together with the managers and supervisors. They have a spot on the agenda where they're regularly talking through, um, mm -hmm. you know, issues coming up with consistency in, in case findings. So that again, it builds that program-wide consistency as well. Sure. Yeah, and I appreciate that during the presentation you you referenced how it's a tool. You know, it doesn't automate the process of making those decisions. Sometimes there's things that fall outside. You know, that are that are hard to hard to wrestle with. So um, I think there's only one question left, and this actually comes from me because this occurred to me while you all were speaking. Do you have any advice for other states or other programs that are wanting to replicate what you've done here? Anything you can think of? Uh, for me, it would just be starting with the messaging. You know, there's a lot of experience mm -hmm. across adult services. And just being honest, some of the county's messaging in California was stronger than others. Uh, overall, it was pretty strong, but a couple of the counties were kind of like hit with this, like, where did this come from? So not only yeah. were we providing the training, but we were having to provide the justification. And it was kind of like a back and forth, which took away from the training. So my yeah. advice, um, just being a trainer in the room when people were prepared, people were supported, people were validated prior before coming into the training, right? Change is hard. I know, but here's the why. It just yeah. seemed to be really, really helpful. So that would be my piece of advice. Yeah, I agree with that, Jess, and that speaks to um, to the importance of having a change management implementation plan. Um, yeah. That you know, what really looking at change management principles, and and so what's the plan going to be for um, for having champions and for the rollout and for the sustainability. Um, uh, yeah, and I mean, a real simple first step if you're like, this sounds interesting, but I'm not sure and I'm not very familiar is, you know, just just look at, take a look at the curriculum, take a look at the tools, um, you know, just kind of start thinking through, you know, would this make sense to, to do within sure. my state? Can I see ways that we can um, start to implement that? Again, the, the curriculum, it's on our website, it's free, you don't need a password or anything, you just, you know, click and go and you can, you know, just start start reviewing it. And, you know, we're happy to answer questions too. Like, I love this project. My staff know, like my team, um, you know, we, we really love this project and we love talking about it. So if there are questions, please feel free to, to reach out. 
great. And I just put a link in chat um, to where folks can, you know, find uh, more information about today's presentation materials. Um, and on your screen, we're just at time. On your screen, you've got um, some more information from our speakers, from Dawn and Jessica, who did a wonderful job providing this information today. Thank you so much to both of you for being here and providing all this. And here's some more information about how you can follow us on social media and how you can reach out to us. We're on Twitter. We're Facebook and we're on LinkedIn. So um, yeah, please do give us a like or follow. Thanks so much again to our presenters today and thanks for our attendees. Uh, we hope everybody has a great rest of your afternoon. All Take right. care. Thank you.